Good afternoon, good afternoon. It's a joy to uh, share with you on uh, this Wednesday. What's today's date? Today is January the 20th. On this Wednesday, um, this is our midday, midweek Bible study, and this is also inauguration day, and I just turned off my TV watching uh, President Joe Biden uh, deliver his inauguration address. Uh, he's still in the midst of that, I am sure. Um, uh, but I did get to witness uh, the swearing in of uh, our new Vice President Kamala Harris and the swearing in of Joseph Biden as president. Um, I was texted by a friend of mine that pastors in Pittsburgh, and he asked me, was I doing Bible study today, and I told him, yeah, I was. Uh, he reminded me that the inauguration was to take place around noon, and you know, of course I knew that. I thought about that days ago, uh, but I had um, determined to go on with the Bible study anyway. So for those of you who are joining us today, I really appreciate it. I don't see any names popping up. Well, I'm starting to see some names come up now or some thumbs up. Uh, I don't know who is um, who is joining me today. I'm not seeing names today and I don't know why. Uh, but I, I do see some uh, reactions popping up on my screen. That might be Susan Askew whose face I see. Uh, but anyway, for all of you who are joining me, I really appreciate it. I don't know how many we have on the line. I'm not seeing names today for some reason, but that's okay. I know that some of you are there. We congratulate Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris, Harris on um, taking over as president and vice president. Uh, it is most certain that we needed a fresh wind to blow through the White House. Uh, I do not I do not regard politicians as saviors. There's just one savior, that's Jesus Christ. But I do recognize that they are uniquely positioned to be able to do things that are helpful to their constituents and to their communities. So uh, while I don't regard them as saviors, I do believe that we will have a much different approach to presiding over the nation and a much different approach to governance uh, with this new administration. And so I appreciate that very much and they do have my support. I, um, I, uh, I respect, uh, regard with respect politicians, but my ultimate trust is in the Lord. And so uh, for all of the problems that our nation faces now, uh, Ultimately, we need God to make the kind of difference uh, that will help us uh, to see a nation of people working together. Uh, it's not just uh, adjudication through the courts. It's not just legislation from local, state, and federal government. It's not just uh, executive actions from presidents and governors and mayors. Uh, all of this ultimately depends on God. Without him, we're absolutely nothing. And so I celebrate along with you this new administration, and I full feel fully confident that, that um, they're going to be doing things quite differently than what we have witnessed in the last four years. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day, for blessings and grace, and for the privilege of gathering virtually. Virtually, We lift up what we are about to do, God, even as we pay attention to what is taking place in our nation. We pray, God, that for all of us, your will be done in us as it is in heaven. And we pray that this study today would be a blessing to all of those who are connected and who will connect up within the next hour. In Jesus' name we pray and claim the victory. Amen. God bless you. Okay, we are on the third week. We're in our third week of Amazing Grace, Lesson 3. 
And uh, we're talking about uh, Joseph and his brothers today and how Grace showed up in that situation and in their relationships. Let's start with this. Again, lesson three of Amazing Grace, and we're in Genesis today, uh, beginning with chapter 37 and all the way through to the end of the Joseph story. And we'll be making some stops here and there at passages of scripture to point some truths or principles out. Uh, let's talk about this. And I hope that you saw the outline on Facebook. I put it there yesterday and we'll follow that outline today. Uh, we, we begin with the principle of sowing and reaping. The principle of sowing and reaping. All of us have heard the expression, you reap what you sow. We're very familiar with that expression. Uh, it has led to other expressions like what goes around, comes around, and actions have consequences. All of us are familiar with those expressions. You reap what you sow, what goes around, comes around, actions have consequences. We, we recognize that as a cause and effect principle, cause and effect principle, and we believe that to be true. Now, the principle of cause and effect or reaping what you sow can can work for you or it can work against you if it works against you it's like you commit a crime and you go to jail so the principle of cause and effect has, has worked against you because you ended up in jail because of something that you did or it can work for you in something as simple as you studied hard and you made good grades so the principle of cause and effect uh, is foundational in life and you can find the principle of cause and effect or reaping what you sow in both the Old and New Testaments. So it's, it's like a principle that's a part of the fabric of life, just like the law of gravity or certain physical laws. There are certain principles, you know, the law of gravity, that's a physical law. It's, it, you know, if it goes up, then it's definitely coming down again. We understand that just like the law of retribution or the law of cause and effect, you reaping what you sow, they're all foundational. There is an idea behind those kinds of principles, and that is there are some things that we need certainty attached to. There are some things that need to be predictable for us so that we have something to hold on to. Y'all see what I'm saying? Uh, the principle of cause and effect is a, a certain kind of principle. It's a predictable principle. I mean, in Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve reaping what they sowed. They sowed a certain um, response to God, which was uh, disobedience or rebellion. And so they reaped a punishment. They were ejected from the garden uh, Man's toiling would change where he would he would sweat to make it and woman would experience pain in childbirth. That's that's the principle of reaping what you sow a cause and effect. Uh, nevertheless, although it is a principle of life, I must say that there have been times when individuals have not reaped what they've sown. And we've seen that before. We have seen people work hard and not and not reap the benefit of the hard work um let's take an old testament job you know job job was god's highest example of godly manhood in the earth but all the stuff that happened to him was not the result of reaping what he sowed and so he experienced a whole lot of conflict and challenges that were not related to the kind of life that he was living. So, although it is a principle, cause and effect, not all the time is what happens to a person something that they have reaped. Uh, there are people who you and I know who have gone to prison unjustly, you know, not guilty of the crimes that they have committed and yet ended up in jail. And so we've seen exceptions, although we recognize that the principle of cause and effect is normally in effect. There is another kind of exception in the kingdom of God 
having to do with cause and effect. And it, it is not the result of sin, but rather is the result. There are some people who experience what is not a reaping because of God's love and because of God's mercy, and that is called grace. And that is what we are studying. Sin sometimes results in bad things happening to good people. Grace is when good things happen to people who do not deserve it. Y'all see that? That's what grace is. Grace is when good things happen to people who do not deserve the good thing. Sometimes because of sin, we don't get what we deserve. But with grace, we get consequences. With grace, rather, we do not get the consequences that we deserve to experience. So then grace is the vehicle that God uses for undeserving people. And what moves God to show that grace to people is his love for the people who experience that grace. Because of grace, God can turn the worst possible stuff into divine opportunities. And because of grace, God can use evil intentions of other people to bless you in spite of their plots and plans. So God has a way of redeeming a situation. And sometimes the way God redeems a situation is he gives undeserving stuff to people. And that's what we call grace. Okay? You're with me so far? All right. Let's go to the next section. We're going we're gonna to look a little bit at some verses in Genesis 37. Um, the principle of people, people not getting what they deserve can be found in the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis and his brother Judah. Joseph was a good person that had to deal with injustice against him. And Judah was a person who did bad things, yet enjoyed prosperity and popularity. So with both of these, it looks like there's an exception to the reaping what you sow rule because what Joseph got, he didn't deserve. And what Judah received was more than you would think he would receive based on what you would think he deserved. Now, with both of them, and they're both brothers, Judah is Joseph's older brother. With both of them, God had a plan for both of them. A plan for Joseph, who had to deal with injustice. A plan for Judah, who did bad things and yet experienced prosperity and popularity. God had a plan for both of them. Um, in Genesis 29 and uh, 30, you can read about Jacob and uh, the births of all of his children. Jacob had 12 sons by four women. Jacob had 12 sons by four women. Um, he had two by the woman he really loved the most, and her name was Rachel. To Rachel, uh, he gave two sons. Rachel gave birth to Joseph, who is the major part of our study today, and she gave birth to Benjamin. And those were the two sons that Jacob loved the most, but Jacob really was crazy about Joseph. Jacob just doted on him, gave him easy assignments. You know, the other brothers had to do stuff. The other 10 brothers, other than Benjamin, uh, they were given normal assignments, but Jacob, but Joseph was not given the kind of assignments his other 10 brothers received. And those were the brothers who were birthed to Jacob from three other women, uh, including his first wife, Leah, and the two servants of Rachel and Leah. But again, back to the main point. Jacob was crazy about Joseph, and he really doted on him. He made, he made um, uh, Joseph a coat, uh, a tunic, an outer garment of many colors as an expression of his particular and special affection for Joseph. Let's look at uh, 
uh, Genesis 37, starting with verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So Joseph's already in trouble because it's kind of a tattletale here. Uh, verse 3, now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. You see, so Joseph is hated because the father shows him, Jacob shows Joseph special affection that he doesn't show to other brothers. Now let's go to verse five of Genesis 37. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. <laughs> so the hate is just growing. Verse six, he said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Okay, I just read, I finished off reading verses 6 through 11 of Genesis 37. So the brothers hate Joseph. They hated him because of all the attention that Jacob gave Joseph, and they hated him because of the dreams that Joseph had that he told them about which made it appear that they would be bowing down to him. And of course, they're thinking, oh, that ain't never going to happen. You are almost the youngest of us all. The only one younger is Benjamin. We will never bow down to you. Joseph is hated, but the scripture says that Jacob, the father of Joseph, kept these dreams in mind. Now, before we go to the next section, remember the text said they hated him and that they hated him all the more. You've got to remember something about hatred. Hatred is rarely passive. Hatred... Hatred is not something that people just sit down and think about. It's rarely passive. The only time that hatred is not carried out is generally when a person is afraid to get caught or to be discovered. But keep that in mind. Keep that principle in mind. The hatred is rarely passive. It normally acts. It normally moves. And when hatred does not move, when it does not move on its emotions, it's generally because the person is afraid to be caught or be discovered. Okay, let's go to the next section. We're still in, we're still in Genesis 37. The, the 10 brothers born before Joseph are now out in the field somewhere with the flocks. Let's go to verse 12 of Genesis 37. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, that's Jacob. Jacob said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. I'm going to send you to them. Very well, Joseph replied. So Jacob said to Joseph, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then they sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, well, let's jump down from there. Uh, let's go to verse 17. Uh, the end of verse 17, Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. They had moved. Verse 18, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, listen to this, they plotted to kill him. What did I tell you? Hatred is rarely passive. Verse 19, here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. That's a, that's a big pit cut out of stone to hold water. And say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Listen to verse 21. Listen to what Reuben says. Reuben heard this, and he tried to rescue Joseph from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern, the pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to, to rescue him from them and take him back to his father, meaning Reuben's plan was 
throw him in the pit, and then Reuben would go back and rescue him from the pit and take him back to Jacob. So Reuben wasn't down with this. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Look at verse 25. They sat down to eat their meal. They looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Now, listen to what the brother Judah says, because we're focusing on Joseph and Judah today. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Judah says, I got a plan. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not lay a hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. So the brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned, so now Reuben wasn't here when this happened. Reuben had gone off. He returned to the cistern, saw that Joseph was not there, tore his clothes, went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. Now, they, they, they had to come up with a plan in terms of what they were going to tell their father, Jacob, about what happened to Joseph. They took the robe back to their father, and they said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Surely Joseph has been torn to pieces. So he's got these 10 brothers. They want to kill him. And then they talked out of that by Reuben. And then Judah comes up with the plan to make some money off of the whole deal. So Joseph is sold. He is abandoned by his brothers. Now, the principle of sowing and reaping is not taking place here because Joseph is not reaping what he has sown. He's a brat, but he doesn't deserve to be killed Notice he deserved to be sold by his brothers into slavery. So they come up with a plan. The father grieves. Now, it doesn't matter that they've gotten rid of Joseph because the grief of Jacob will remind them every day of how Jacob felt about Joseph and will remind them of the fact that they were the ones that got rid of Joseph and that they followed Judah's plan and that they have not informed their father about what they really knew. So the father's grief, Jacob's grief, will not allow them to forget what they had done. Here it looks like the wicked are prospering and the innocent are suffering. We don't really see uh, the, uh, we don't really see someone reaping what they sow, but we do see in this text the wicked prospering. Okay, now let's move for a second to Genesis 39 because Genesis 39 contains everything, not everything, but much of what happened to Joseph when he's in Egypt. Remember now, we're talking, our study is on grace. We're looking at the life of Joseph. We're looking, we're looking at interaction with his brother Judah because Judah is very prominent in the Joseph story when you read the Bible beginning at chapter 37. You all know what happened in chapter 39. Uh, let's, let's read a few verses from 39 of Genesis. Verse number one, Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph. Remember that. You all remember that because it's quoted often in Genesis. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, that's Potiphar, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So what's happening with Joseph? Joseph is prospering because God is with him in Egypt, and everything that Joseph put his hands to, God is blessing. There is something in Joseph that God sees that, that places favor on Joseph's life. And the favor that Joseph is experiencing is unmistakably noticed by the person who employs him 
who then puts Joseph in charge of everything in his household. So we're talking about Potiphar, who is an Egyptian official. Now, you y'all know what happened to to Joseph at Potiphar's house. House, verse seven of Genesis thirty-nine. And after a while, his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told Potiphar's wife, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing Mm -hmm. right and sin against God that's what Joseph says to Potiphar's wife so Potiphar's wife uh, gets upset y'all remember that and she accuses uh, Potiphar of trying to uh, molest her and he ends up in prison all right so all of that is in Genesis 39 7 through 20 but in 21 uh, it says, the end of 20 in Genesis 39 says, but while Joseph was there in prison, and then verse 21, the law was with him. He showed kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the law was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So Joseph is in a place that he didn't, that, that, that justice did not put him in. He has experienced injustice, but at the same time, in spite of the injustice, he's experiencing the grace and the favor of God, even in prison. Favor in Potiphar's house, but favor even in prison. So the Lord can be with you in more than one place. Keep that in mind. That's another principle y'all need to think about today. It just popped into my head that he's got favor both in Potiphar's house and in prison, which means that your location does not determine whether you can receive or, or experience the favor of God in your own life. And that ought to help you and I, because sometimes we end up in situations we don't want to be in, and we fail to see God in it because we think that we have ended up somewhere where God's favor cannot be manifest. But God is not limited to the places that he can bless and keep you. Okay? All right. Keep that in mind. All right. Let's go to the next section. Okay. We, so we talked in a general way about what, um, what um, Joseph experienced. Some ups and some downs. Continued injustice. Now, not only an unjust uh, treatment by his brothers, but unjust treatment by Potiphar's wife and by Potiphar himself by putting him in prison for something that he was not guilty of. Okay, now, the other person in this in this story and in this study today that we want to look at is one of Joseph's older brothers, who is Judah. Uh, we're going to chapter 38 of Genesis. So turn to 38 in your Bibles, chapter 38. At that time, verse 1, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. Shua. Judah married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. Verse 5, she gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kizib that she gave birth to him. All right, let's read a little bit further. We got the firstborn son named Ur. Verse 6 of Genesis 38 says, Judah got a wife for Ur. So Judah, the, the daddy, got a wife for his firstborn son, Ur. Her name was Tamar. Listen to the end of verse 7. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Verse 8, then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her 
as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. That's verse 8. Let's stop right there for a second because there was a an ancient law during that time called levirate marriage. Levirate marriage. And that law said that if, if the husband of a woman died early, that one of the relatives would then be obligated to take up that dead husband's obligations toward that widow. Many times it would be the brother of, um, of the husband who died that would take up the responsibility. So many times it would end up being the brother-in-law taking the place of the brother if the brother died early on. Let's go back to the text. Judah said to Onan, verse 8 of Genesis 38, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from provide, providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. <laughs> okay, so we got the first brother, Ur. He's wicked. He dies. We got the second brother, Marin, the same woman, Tamar. He's wicked. He dies, according to verse 10. So listen to what Judah says in verse 11 of Genesis 38. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. And listen to this now. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. Okay, so what does Judah say? Judah says, I've had two sons marry this woman and die. I don't want my third son to marry her and die too. I don't want to have happened to him what happened to Ur and Onan. So he says to Tamar, Tamar, look, Shelah's too, uh, too young to get married right now. So keep wearing your widow's garments and uh, just live with your daddy. And after Shelah grows up, then he'll marry you and, and take care of you like his brothers would have. Now listen, the end of verse 11 says, so Tamar went to live in her father's household. So she goes back and she is, she is to wait until Shelah, the third son, grows into manhood and can marry her. But look at verse 12. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hira the Adolamite went with him. Now, let me explain what's happening here. Verse 12 says, after a long time, which means a long time had passed and Shelah was never given over, over by Judah to marry Tamar. So that means, and we already saw it in the text, that, that Judah was afraid that if his last son married Tamar, that he would die too. But now it wasn't Tamar's fault that the first two husbands died. It was their wickedness <laughs> that led them to die. But Judah wasn't taking no chances with that last son, Shelah. He ain't have no intent. Uh, and then the text says, and we just read it, that at, after a long time, Judah's wife died. So Judah and Shelah are now in position to take, uh, to take the place of Ur and Onan and be married to Tamar. The father and the son are not available to do that. But again, Judah ain't have no intent of marrying her himself or of allowing Shelah to marry her. So at a certain point, Tamar realizes, oh, this ain't going to happen. He lied to me. He was just messing with me. He was, uh, he was pulling my leg. He has no intention of giving the third son over to marry me. Look at verse 13 of Genesis 38. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep. This is a sheep shearing festival where people gather, shear sheep, uh, make money, make contracts. It, it's a money thing. And they all these dudes gather who own all these flocks and they barter with each other. They shear their sheep, they sell the wool, they make money, they drink a lot of wine. 
and they got things going on with women who are there, who are, who, who are gathered there to get with these men. 13 says, when Tamar was told your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes. Now, she'd been wearing the widow's clothes a long time because remember verse 12 says, after a long time. She took off her widow's clothes, verse 14, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself and then sat down at the entrance to Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Shelah had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. So Tamar knows that Judah ain't got no intent of letting Shelah marry her. Verse 15, Judah sees Tamar, but he doesn't know who she is because she's got a veil on and dressed like a prostitute. He thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Verse 16, not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you, Tamar asked. But again, he doesn't know it's Tamar. He says, I'll send you a young goat from my flock. So she says, she don't trust him. So she says to him, will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? He said in verse 18, what pledge should I give you? She says, give me your seal and the cord it's on. That's a, a little bronze thing that, that Jacob would use to sign documents, put his mark on a thing to solidify a contract or an agreement. She said, your seal and the cord it's on and give me the staff. Y'all know the long staff with the curve, the hooked end, the staff in your hand. So he gave them to her. He gave her the seal and the staff. And the text says in verse 18 that Tamar became pregnant by her father-in-law Judah. But now Judah again did not know who she was. Verse 19, after she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, verse 20, Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adullamite in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he didn't find her. Of course he didn't find her. Tamar was gone. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at Enon? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So what does Tamar do? She comes up with a plan, and that plan is to trick Judah into sleeping with her because she knew he would be going to the sheep shearing festival and to get something from him that she could use for later. That's why she got that seal and that staff. She got, because the staff wasn't just some crooked stick. It was something that Judah carved himself. And then, of course, the seal that he signed documents with was particular only to him. So he sends the goat to her, but she can't be found because she's gone. And when he finds that out, he says, well, I'll just have to make me another staff and get me another seal to sign my documents. Now, uh, what happens is it is discovered that Tamar is pregnant and word gets back to Judah that, he, that she's pregnant. Listen to verse 24 of Genesis 38. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution and as a result, she is now pregnant. Now remember, who is Judah? Judah's the person that came up with the idea to throw Joseph in the pit and to make some money off of him and sell him in the slavery. And the rest of the brothers accepted his idea. So Judah hears in verse 24 that Tamar is pregnant, right? Judah says, bring her out and have her burn to death. The widow is accused of being a prostitute and she's pregnant, but she's pregnant by her father-in-law Judah, who doesn't know it. Verse 25, as she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. And what's the these? The these is the seal and the staff. She sends a message to the one who made her pregnant. I'm pregnant by the one who owns these things, the seal and the staff, and the seal and staff belong to Judah, the one who's observing them. Verse 26, Judah recognized them and said, she's more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, 
there were twin boys in her womb. Okay, we'll stop right there. That's almost the end of chapter 38 of Genesis. So Judah has to own up to the fact. He's indignant when he hears she's pregnant, but then she's able to show to others that she's pregnant by the one who is indignant. So Judah has tried to play like, oh, I'm, I got it together. I'm righteous. I'm doing everything the right way. But she's got, she's got evidence that he has mistreated her and that he has slept with her. So Judah admitted his sin. Now, the plan that Tamar came up with was to avoid being destitute because she had sat alone as a widow for so long and no one had ministered to her needs. So she came up with this plan to expose Judah and the plan worked and Judah admitted his sin. Now, Judah is exposed to his community and so you might say, he got what he deserved, although some might say with all of the treachery that went on in his life, he hadn't really suffered for what he did because he hadn't suffered or paid for seemingly what he did to his brother Joseph. Okay, so y'all with me so far? We are looking at Joseph and his brother Judah. We're talking about grace in this situation. We're looking at Joseph not receiving the kind of justice that he should in terms of his brothers, but at the same time experiencing the favor of God in Egypt. We're looking at Judah, who seemingly got away with all this stuff until he was exposed by his daughter-in-law, Tamar. All right. Now, we move forward a little bit now because now we're bringing this thing back together. And we're talking about grace in this situation between Joseph and his brothers, and particularly Judah. Beginning in chapter, go to chapter 42 of Genesis. Chapter 42 of Genesis. We are now 20 years past Joseph being sold into slavery. In chapter 41 of Genesis, um, Joseph comes up with a plan to save Egypt. Because remember now, he's been in prison. He has, he has met the cupbearer and the baker who were both placed in prison. The king had placed them in prison. And then they learn, Joseph learns that the king has had some, well, first Joseph learns that the cupbearer and the baker had had dreams. The baker's dream meant that the baker would die. The cupbearer's dream meant that the cupbearer would live and go back to service in the king. So he goes back to the service of the king and he forgets about Joseph and doesn't say anything about Joseph to the king or to the Pharaoh for two years. In chapter 41 of Genesis, Joseph is called upon to interpret the dreams of the Pharaoh. And he tells the Pharaoh, Pharaoh, what's happening is we're getting ready to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine after that. And what's going to happen is you're going to need to store up supplies and grain and all of that for seven years so that when the seven years of famine come, you'll have exactly what you need. You can read that in chapter 41 of Genesis around verses 33 through 36. So Joseph is placed as second in command in Egypt. Look at how far he's come. Pitt, Potiphar's house. Prison, palace, been some ups and downs, sold by his brothers into slavery, but all the while God was with him and experienced the favor of God. And so after coming up with that plan for Pharaoh and for seven years of famine in Egypt and seven years of plenty, Joseph is made second in command and Joseph's now got it going on. He is second in command to the king, the Pharaoh of Egypt. The rest of the famine is killing everywhere else so badly that the brothers of Joseph have to go to Egypt to get supplies, to get grain, to get food. So Jacob sends 10 brothers, the 10 born before um, Joseph, to Egypt to get grain and to come back to Canaan with those supplies and with that grain. When they get there, uh, let's let me read some of... Um, Chapter 42 of Genesis. 
Verse 3 from chapter 42. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's, or Jacob's sons, were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land. Y'all see that? Joseph, the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Verse 7 of chapter 42, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. So Joseph accused them of being spies. He talked harshly to them. Um, he recognized them, but because he's dressed as an Egyptian and speaking Egyptian language at the moment, they do not recognize him. You see that in verses 6 through 13 of Genesis 42. So he said, look, I'm going to send y'all back with some food, but y'all got to y'all got to leave one of your brothers here. Uh, that's what he says to them. Uh, let's see if I can find it in chapter 42. And in verse, uh, verse 19, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. So Joseph tells them as the governor of Egypt, uh, if y'all are honest, leave one of your brothers here, take the supplies back, come back and get more, and bring your younger brother Benjamin with you. Now, what Joseph did was he filled their sacks with grain, but he put the money they brought to pay for it back in the sacks of grain. And so that kind of troubled them when they got back to Canaan and, and discovered that. Well, of course, because Benjamin was the other son from Rachel, um, Jacob, he wasn't having that, letting Benjamin go back to Egypt with them because they were already holding the other son, Simeon. Y'all see that? Chapter 43, let me read chapter 43 of Genesis verses uh, 32, chapter 43, verses 15 and 16. So the men took the gifts and doubled the amount of silver and Benjamin also. So they eventually talked Jacob into letting Benjamin go back. And y'all remember the story. They get back uh, to, to Egypt in chapter 43, verse 11 of chapter 43 says, Israel said to them, or Jacob said, if it must be, do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift, a little balm and a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachios and almonds. So they take Benjamin back and y'all know what happened. They went, they went through a little, there's a dinner that Joseph throws for them. And it's at that dinner that Joseph reveals to them that he is their brother. Chapter 44 of Genesis begins, Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry. Put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. So he's giving them back the money again. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for his grain. That would be Benjamin's sack. And he did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after those men at once, and when you catch up with them, say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? So they're brought back, and it's when they're brought back, uh, and they're pleading with Joseph uh, and saying to him that they had done nothing wrong, that Joseph revealed himself to them in chapter 45 of Genesis. Joseph could no longer control himself, verse 1, before all his attendants. He cried, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. 
And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Verse 7, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So Joseph revealed to himself and he told his brothers, uh, I'm going to take care of you. And his brothers were fearful, but Joseph showed them grace. Listen, this is what this is all about. Joseph has experienced the favor of God in Egypt. He's been treated unjustly by his brothers, although he was a brat and a tattletale. He didn't deserve what they did to him. But he has now grown. Listen, it was the favor of God that blessed him, but it was also the favor of God that matured him in Egypt. And so he sh they're feeling guilt, but he shows them grace. He shows grace in particular to Judah because Judah is the one that came up with the plan to sell him into slavery. So they're consumed by guilt, but Joseph is consumed by grace. So they go from experiencing the guilt within themselves to the grace that Joseph showed them as their brother. And listen, that means then that in this situation, they did not really reap what they had sown. What they actually experienced was the grace and favor of Joseph, who was in position to show them grace and favor. Y'all see that? All right. Now, remember, keep in mind this principle that what matured Joseph in Egypt was the grace and the favor God showed him. Remember that. It was favor that matured Joseph in Egypt so that he was able, by his thinking, to show grace to his brothers when he was reunited with them 20 years later. All right, one more thing and we'll be done. I, I want to take you to chapter 49 of the book of Genesis because when we get to 49, remember that Joseph had moved his family to Egypt with him. That's how, you know, that's what led to uh, Hebrews being enslaved in Egypt when we get to the book of Exodus because we're talking about, you know, hundreds of years later. In chapter 49 of Genesis, Jacob is close to dying and he calls all of his sons around him to talk about their futures and to give them his blessings. Normally, the first, if there's more than one son, that firstborn son will receive a double portion compared to the other brother or to all the other brothers. So all the sons are gathering around, gathering around Jacob for the blessing. Um, whoever received that double portion would also be designated as the head of the family when Jacob passed. Everybody, I am sure, now the text does not say this, does not say this, but I'm thinking that the other brothers would think, well, he will choose Joseph because of everything Joseph went through and how Joseph persevered in it, how Joseph handled it. Joseph and, and the grace that he has shown us, we are sure that he will choose Joseph. But Jacob did not choose Joseph to give the double portion blessing to. Who was the firstborn? The firstborn is Reuben. Uh, let's listen to what Jacob says to the firstborn in verse 3 of Genesis 49. Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. You're turbulent as the waters. You will no longer excel, for you went up under your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. What happened was Reuben slept with one of his daddy's concubines, and daddy didn't like that. So Reuben <laughs> did not get the double portion blessing. Who would be next in line? Simeon and Levi. Look at verse 5 of Genesis 49. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. They had killed a whole bunch of folk. Um, let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they please. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. So they didn't get the blessing either because of their violence. That's Simeon and Levi. The blessing actually went to Judah. Judah, the same one that said, let's sell his butt 
Judah, the same one who mistreated Tamar and slept with his daughter-in-law. Listen, listen to verse number 8 of Genesis 49. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. And that goes on through verse 12. Judah got the double portion. Judah. The, listen, it's, it's like, oh, I mean, when you think of Jacob and all of the stuff he did, and yet he was the one that God chose, God be knowing some stuff that we don't know. And it doesn't make sense to us, but God is operating from a divine sovereignty that sometimes we do not understand. Ju Listen, so what's Jacob saying about Judah? He's saying that Judah's descendants would be kings. So who comes from the tribe of Judah? David, the king that unified Israel. Who comes from the tribe of Judah? Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. He is a descendant. The Jesus of time, who is the Christ of eternity, is a descendant of the line of Judah as well. Judah didn't deserve any of that, which means that what he experienced was the grace of God, a lifetime of sin and hypocrisy, but he is brought by God's grace to a place of humility and gratitude, not by threatening him with punishment, but by the grace of God is he brought to the place of humility and gratitude. He didn't find grace. Grace found him. And what does that mean? That grace is not reserved for good people. Grace is what understores the goodness of God. Hear me, hear that last point. Grace is not something that is reserved for good people. It is something that underscores the goodness of God. Okay, that's grace uh, in the life of Joseph and, and uh, Judah. Hope that that lesson will be a blessing to you today. I appreciate y'all joining with me today. All of those who watch the um, the rest of the inauguration proceedings, especially the pre the speech from the president, they can pick this up off of Facebook tonight or later on this afternoon, because when I get through with this, I will hit the share button and it will be placed on, um, on the church Facebook page. All right, we've got what do we have? We got this weekend. We've got Saturday, the food bank from 10 to 12, and we've got virtual worship at 9. Got some new things I want to do coming up, and I'll tell you about them next week. We are praying today for healing and recovery of Keisha Carter, Latanya Cook. Uh, we're praying for Marie White and George Lee, uh, Ted Berry, Errol Harper, Nero Brown, um, Tanya Arnold. The family of Doris Neal. We're praying for Constance Hood today and Joe and Loretta Nunnally. Uh, let's keep them in prayer, please. All right, bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this day, for your blessings and grace and for uh, the privilege of gathering us virtually today, God. We lift up all who are on the line and those who will be uh, viewing this later, God, we pray that your word will go forth in a mighty way and that we might learn the wonderful lessons of grace that we find in Scripture. We lift up the names we've called and others who are on our prayer list, God, that needs would be met, bodies would be healed, souls would be comforted, God. We pray that every need met and every soul be satisfied. We pray for the salvation of the unsaved, God. We pray for increase at providence numerically and spiritually and financially, God. We lift up especially those who are sick and grieving and shut in among us. We pray for our nation, God, as it moves forward with a new administration for our national, our state, and local governments, God, that in all of those who represent the people, that your will would be done in them as it is in heaven. We love you, God. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. I didn't call any names today because I didn't. no names were coming up on my screen, so I don't know who was tuning in, but I appreciate you and uh, look forward to connecting with y'all. We're going to do this again next week.
noon, we'll be on lesson four. God bless you. Have a great day and a great rest of the week.